Hello, everyone. Welcome to our monthly Indigenous film series. I have got a few links. I apologize. There we go. I am Jean Schumann from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am your virtual host this evening, if you couldn't tell by the fact that I was jabbering at you the whole time. Uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is very pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and the Denver American Indian Commission to present an indigenous <coughs> film. As you watch the presentation tonight, please put any questions or comments you have in the chat. Uh, we'll be watching this chat throughout the event and we look forward to hearing what you have to say about this incredible film. Uh, if you were not able to view the film before tonight's event, I will put the link into the chat in just a moment. Yep, there it is. It will be available through 1159 on May 12th. So if you didn't get a chance to watch that, maybe you can spend some time tonight, check that out absorb, think about the discussion. Um, and that's all I have to say. I am thrilled to get out of the way and leave the discussion up to the professionals. So to begin tonight's event, I would like to introduce Jean Rubin from the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Take it away, Jean. Thank you, Jean. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. I'm Jean Rubin. I direct the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival, which is a program of the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. With me is Merv Tano. He is president of our institute. We present this monthly Indigenous film series with our partners, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Denver American Indian Commission. And as always, we extend a huge thank you to not only everyone you see on screen, but all the folks who work behind the scenes to make this program possible. We also thank this year's media sponsor, Kubo Jazz Radio. Before we begin tonight's program, I want to make a quick announcement about next month's program. We will be screening a feature film entitled Night Raiders on June 8th. That's also a Wednesday, second Wednesday of the month. This will be an in-theater program in the Phipps Theater in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Following the film, the, the director, Dana Goulet, will be zooming in for a live discussion and Q&A, also in the theater. Uh, so just to be absolutely clear, there is no home viewing option for next month's program. But if you've been looking for an excuse <laughs> to get out for a night out, this will be a wonderful program. And I really hope we will see you there. OK, on to tonight's program. I think most of you have already watched the documentary. Um, as Jean said, if you haven't, you have until uh, midnight tomorrow night to, to catch it. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome two speakers. Uh, if you've seen the film, you've already been introduced to Sharon Asatoya. Sharon has been advocating for Indigenous rights and especially the rights of Indigenous women for decades. Sharon is the CEO and founder of the Native American Community Board and the Native American Women's Health Education Resource Center, both on the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. As you saw in the film, the center addresses issues of reproductive justice, violence against women, and environmental justice. The organization also has a shelter for women fleeing from sexual assault and domestic abuse. Sharon has a long list of accomplishments well beyond what you see in the film and well beyond what I can cover in an introduction, but I will try to point out just a few of the highlights. She was appointed to the National Advisory Council for Health and Human Services by President Clinton. She has served on numerous national and international advisory committees and working groups focusing on issues of health and environmental justice and Indigenous rights. This includes facilitating a working group at the United Nations on the current status of health of the world's Indigenous peoples at a meeting that was convened by the High Commission on Human Rights. Sharon has written extensively on women's health reproductive justice issues. Under her direction, her organization released the Indigenous Women's Health Book within the Sacred Circle, and also organized the first Indigenous Women's Reproductive Rights Coalition. 
we have a couple of links in the chat room where you can find more information about the organization's accomplishments under Sharon's direction. Our second guest is Danielle Seawalker, an artist, writer, and activist who currently serves as co-chair of the Denver American Indian Commission. Danielle was one of the featured artists in our festival art exhibit uh, last year that was entitled Resilience in Times of Adversity, and she will be joining us for a virtual program on placemaking that uh, is being hosted by Lakewood, uh, the Lakewood Heritage Center on June 21st, so you are all invited to join us for that as well. And I want to take a, a moment to thank Danielle for bringing AMA to our attention and helping us develop tonight's program. Uh, also in the chat room is a link to Danielle's website. Uh, you can read more about her work and in particular what she refers to as her passion project, the Red Road Project. So with that, um, I am going to turn the mic over to Merv to get our discussion underway. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Uh, appreciate you all joining us uh, for uh, this uh, discussion about, uh, I, I think, a real uh, important film. Uh, and I think uh, the filmmaker did uh, a really good job uh, in setting out uh, a, in a very understated way, the, the broader policy implications of, uh, of what the non-consensual, the forcible sterilization of uh, uh, Indian women really uh, is about. Uh, for uh, about 10 years, uh, I, I was the uh, <coughs> director of, of policy and budget uh, at the uh, Administration for Native Americans uh, in Washington, D.C. And the way I got that job uh, was I was uh, looking at the uh, budget submissions and the, the uh, program uh, initiatives that were being proposed by the Administration for Native Americans on behalf of the uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Office, assistant secretary's office and i uh, had a frank discussion with the uh, uh the commissioner of uh, administration for native americans and said look you're talking about sovereignty you're talking about self-determination and yet the programs you are suggesting for indian tribes are all about what you think is important what your priorities are uh as as a federal agency, uh, it's not what the tribes think are important. It's not what the tribes think their priorities are. And he said, okay, thank you. And then about a month later, uh, I got an offer to uh, join his uh, staff to uh, help uh, the sets uh, put my money where my mouth was. And I really enjoyed working in that, uh, uh, in that policy arena. And, and for me, what the filmmaker and what people like Sharon uh, and, and the other folks who are, are uh, whose stories are, are, are being told, really just very graphically uh, viscerally demonstrate the extent to which the federal government had control over Indian tribes, Indian people, and especially Indian women. Now, there are discussions about, uh, about boarding school. There are discussions about sterilizations. There's uh, discussions about uh, the paucity of, of, of health care. And all of that 
is part of a, an overarching or undergirding uh, policy uh, or interpretation of policy, interpretation of, of, uh, of uh, case law. I said, all right, the relationship between Indian tribes, Indian people, and the federal government is like that of a guardian to a ward. Understand what that means, a guardian to a ward. You get to be a ward if you're incompetent. You get to be a ward uh, if you're a, 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 a minor. Upon attaining your majority, attaining uh, uh, competence, uh, you're no longer uh, in need of a of a guardian, and yet that guardianship never went away. It was only through the efforts of people like Sharon that control over the the pernicious. Uh, overturning that uh, pernicious control by federal agencies and regaining their self-determination, acting out their self-determination, uh, their individual and, and tribal sovereignty uh, happened. It wasn't through the, the good graces of uh, of federal policymakers, because what what is fascinating about this this film is how the interpretation of noble ideas is transformed into vicious, degrading policies, and that is because of the unbridled control the federal government have had over Indian people and Indian tribes. And it's been a fight and the fight still continues uh, today. Uh, and I appreciate the uh, folks like uh, Danielle and Sharon for uh, their, their efforts to sense rest control over, over their lives from uh, federal agencies and federal uh, uh, trustees. So with that, I'd like to start off with a question to Sharon. Uh, say, by way of uh, kind of uh, introduction, what other examples have you had to deal with uh, where the federal agencies have had uh, so much control over the lives of uh, your family, uh, of, of friends, and you yourself? And I guess the follow-up question would be, and what have you had to do to regain that uh, uh, control to attain your sovereignty? Um, you know, one of the, now that's a really loaded question um, for, for uh, it, it, you know, in my generation, and, and like I said earlier, I'm 71 years old. Um, it was really important to to um, make this uh, film and to be able to organize, use it as an organizing tool. Uh, we have a lot of young women who, first of all, it's not being taught in schools, the history of, of the sterilization that took place on Indian country, um, not even in Indian schools. Um, so, you know, in order to stop this from ever happening again, uh, we thought we could use this as an organizing tool to get young women to be aware, to ask questions when they go in for, um, you know, their OBGYN 
uh, not to just go along with everything that uh, Indian Health Service suggests. And, you know, they have to know why. They have to know our history. They have to know what's happened uh, to us. And uh, the film really, um, uh, the way Jean Whitehorse uh, in, in, in her story rolls out uh, is excellent. It, it explains how the government went about it, you know, um, with, with the uh, um, relocation, uh, how she had no choice in the matter. Um, you know, there, there, we just have to um, make sure that the next generations are aware of what has happened, of our history. And this film, we have been using it as an organizing tool to inform the, the younger generation. And also there's an, a lot of women out there, native women that thought they were the only ones that this had happened to, were, um, I found it very difficult to discuss with, with uh, you know, family, um, with their nieces and, and uh, uh, grandchildren and so on. And the film opened up a lot for, for uh, our women and being able to share their stories. And, and women were coming out from all over wanting to, um, to share their stories. And this is one way that we can um, uh, decolonize and assert ourselves within our communities to inform ourselves and the, the next generation so that this does not continue to happen. And the only way it's, it's gonna stop is if um, we stand up and do something about it. We organize, if we inform each other. And um, uh, that's what was so powerful about this film and, uh, and, and how many women, uh, Native women came out to uh, support uh, support the film and uh, share it with their um, with their family members. You know, it 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 engage it it uh, stimulated uh, uh, the conversation. You know, around the kitchen table, which is where our aunties and our sisters and our grandmas uh, seem to do a lot of uh, information sharing, and um, it's just. You know, it was a very powerful way to uh, inform the younger generation. We've taken it into the schools. We've used it as an organizing tool and we'll continue to do so because we still have young women asking, well, how did this happen? Why did it happen? And um, we know that anytime uh, somebody wants something, uh, that we have usually are natural resources. They target women, they target indigenous women so that they can control, control us, control what we do and do whatever they can to stop the next generation from coming forth. And uh, sterilization, whether it be surgical sterilization um, or uh, pharmaceutical sterilization, uh, you know, has has um, happened, and uh, we just need our younger generation to be aware of this, so that they will do what they can to prevent it, and will recognize it when it's happening in their communities. So I'm hoping I ans asked uh, answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Um... So let, let me ask uh, uh, Danielle uh, uh, to weigh in and, uh, uh, and, and then uh, afterwards we'll open it up to uh, everyone else. Uh, the, okay, I, uh, we know you as a commissioner, uh, we know you as, as an artist, we know you as a as a uh, uh, supporter of uh, of uh, the Indian community of, of and uh, supporter of the Institute uh, 
uh, we love your art, uh, and we know you're an activist. And when confronted, when you're confronted with these kind of uh, uh, horrific uh, events, how does your activism, your your uh, your art, uh, in, including uh, your uh, support of, of the filmmaking art and, and other of your interests, how how do you bring those to bear to uh, do what uh, Sharon has has done to let people know what has happened? Because most people are totally unaware of the relationship between Indian tribes, Indian people, and the federal government. I mean, I was in the army, and uh, uh, most guys I talked with believe that Indians got a monthly check. Uh, uh, they, they, they have no idea of what the, the trust relationship is and, and what that has meant to individual Indians and to families and to the tribes. So that's the question for you. <laughs> <laughs> was that a question? <laughs> like, what's, what's the question? <laughs> no. I'm Petu Washtemi Takuyapi, Daniel C. Walker Machiapi, Mahum Papa Lakota, Naina Waslata, and Mahata, Denver, Colorado, Elwati. Good, good evening, good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, my name is Danielle C. Walker. I am Hunk Papa Lakota um, from the Standing Rock uh, Sioux Nation, I, but I currently reside here in Denver, Colorado, and I'm a, a very proud resident of Denver since 2018. Um, I grew up in North Dakota. I grew up with a father who, um, when he was born, wasn't even, didn't have the right to vote. You know, we, our, our Native people didn't have the right to vote until the late 1970s. I grew up with a grandmother who didn't, wasn't considered an American citizen um, when she was born, despite us, our families being here for generations since the beginning of time. Um, and so I grew up kind of around family who, who told stories. And, you know, I, I come from a generation where I was, you know, left with something better than the previous generation. And I'm so grateful for that. And I didn't know about this history. Um, until I started doing research for a mural. As you mentioned, I am an artist, I'm a visual artist. I also am a writer and I'm, I'm currently actually working on a documentary film about urban Native Americans and the Relocation Act. Um, but I, I, was, I was researching a mural last summer um, and I wanted to do something centered around the American Indian movement, but the women that were the backbone behind this movement. Back in the, the 60s and 70s, it was the men who were the face of this movement, but it was the women really who were doing the things to stop some of these actions, including sterilization. My auntie Phyllis Young was one of those women alongside Madonna Thunderhawk who helped to raise the voice during this era that this was happening. Um, and so I was doing a lot of research and, and um, uncovered that this history, you know, and I heard about this film and I, I was just, I mean, not, it's really sad to say I wasn't even shocked to understand and learn this history because I feel like as Native people, we are so desensitized to the horrendous treatment that we've had since um, 1492. And um, it's just time and time again, and it's still continuing to happen today. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like there is a massive distrust, a massive dent between and, and big relationship issue between the, the the governments whether it's local state federal and native indigenous people because of the constant constant attempts at assimilation at cultural genocide forced removal you know they here in colorado and in denver you know denver was one of the relocation cities in the 50s and 60s all the way through even the 70s where where they were trying to get natives to come off the reservation and come to the city and live this American dream life, but really it was an attempt at assimilation and to get them off the land so they could take some more of their reservation land. But before that, they, they forced natives off these lands in Colorado and in Denver. And it was, you know, and then they call it relocation. And I'm like, this is not relocation. This is rehoming. This is returning, you know, so these, these government issued programs and that, you know, that's just one of so many different examples of 
all these attempts that the government has done to remove indigenous people. And I, I'm happy that I'm even here today speaking because I shouldn't be here. Um, my, you know, my grandma was a boarding school student. She was the generation that grew up only speaking Lakota language and was brainwashed to the point where she never passed it on to her children, my father and his siblings. So I never learned it fluently. Um, and, you know, she would tell us, you don't need to learn our, our cultural ways because those aren't going to get you anywhere. And so the fact that I'm even here speaking, um, is a privilege and an honor and I'm happy to be here, but, um, you know, there is a lot of work to be done and I'm so thankful that we have filmmakers and artists and storytellers and writers and, and you like Gina Merv bringing films to the public in ways that maybe wouldn't have ever touched anybody to learn these histories that are so needed. Um, so I'll stop chatting for now, but that's kind of, kind of my perception on, on this film and kind of that, that relationship between the government and native people. Thank you. Are, are there any questions over there? Yeah, let me, I'm scrolling up because we had. Um, okay, so uh, someone has a kind of a longish comment here. Uh, it says we can't ignore that the decision to sterilize is part of genocidal plan to eliminate the tribe so the federal government doesn't have to honor the treaties. How many elected representatives are aware of this and still choose to participate? All of them, uh, same ones pressuring a Supreme Court. So I don't know if uh, you want to weigh in on, on your interactions with um, with federal representatives. You know, Sharon, you mentioned um, James Aberesk as a, as a real ally. So you know, it, it does get to be kind of a, a mix. Yeah. Um when uh when uh this became aware uh you know some of the women in women of all red nations uh went and approached uh jim and uh you know uh, hey look um you know something needs to be done um he also was really uh, a big um support when we brought the information to him that Depo Provera was being used on indigenous women um, to stop it and to uh, he, he uh, convened some Senate committee hearings uh, on it and um, and uh, you know it it um, helped to uh, bring to the forefront what was going on but We've, uh, our organization has worked on uh, reproductive justice issues for like 35 years. And we're the organization that um, pretty much got the Indian Health Service to um, include uh, uh, the morning after pill or plan B um, as an OTC over the counter. And when we met, when we were meeting in Washington, um, with the um, Health and Human Services because they oversee the Indian Health Service. Um, we had Amnesty International and uh, the ACLU as our attorneys and we were suing them um, because all the other women in this country had access to it except for, for us uh, within Indian Health Service. And we were meeting with some of the attorneys and the top administrators and their attitude was shocking. They're the old guard. Um, they feel that because they're providing health services that um, they can decide right. who gets what. It's very paternalistic. Um, it was uh, very eye-opening um, to just be sitting there and, and listening um, to these folks talk. We've also met, we also met with the, the higher echelon with Indian Health Service and we had um, staff within the IHS that would pull us aside and say, um, you know, you, you need to be aware of this, this and that and these policies and the old guard is still there and they're gonna be there in those attitudes until they retire or they drop dead. Um, and it's been that way and, and uh, that trickles down into the service unit 
onto the reservations and what they think they can do right. um, in terms of uh, contraceptives. And, you know, when, when uh, all the sterilization was going on, um, you know, they were tying tubes, you know, women's tubes. And for the, for the general population, it was family planning. It was never presented to us like that. It was, um, you know, birth control. It was uh, um, how basically to uh, uh, to d diminish our population and not to assist women with planning their families. So that whole attitude um, really. Uh, says a lot in terms of um, what they were trying to do and, and uh, with Native women and other women of color in this country. Um, you know, it was obvious uh, a genocide. It was obvious uh, attempts to, um, to control uh, our population. And we still have issues with um, uh, birthing and um, and, and the amount of C-sections that are done, they're done for the convenience of the uh, physician and not what's best for a mother and her family. Um, there are scheduled women, you know, uh, delivery services that have been taken out of many uh, Indian Health Service hospitals forcing uh, our women to have to travel, uh, you know, 50, 60, 100 miles. Uh, for a delivery. So they schedule a C-section when a C-section is not even necessary, it's not needed, but it's for the convenience of the uh, healthcare provider. But it also um, reduces the number of vaginal births that a woman can have. So it's another more modern way of mm -hmm. controlling uh, our population and uh, by trying to diminish our uh, the number of uh, births that, that our, our women have, our young women. So uh, it's, it's um, really important that uh, we be aware of, of all of these methods and the fact that it's not over. Yes. It's not over. And as long as we have water and timber and oil and gold and natural resources on our land, Native women will be targeted uh, for population reduction and control. So, um, yeah, it's it's um, it, it's not going to stop. Um, so we have to really fight back, make uh, our young women aware, and uh, so that they'll fight back for their rights. And uh, the struggle continues. When we started uh, the, uh, the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management uh, back in what, 97 was it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we did so uh, uh, because we had uh, a, a, a couple of uh, uh, programs that we were operating. One was on the human genome program uh, because there was a, uh, <sighs> There was a move afoot to uh, uh, to get the DNA from all the indigenous peoples because they were uh, the the purest of uh, of uh, the human race and the, their uh, their genetic uh, information, their tissues were were very important to the work of researchers, of uh, the medical profession. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, etc. Uh, and then this, that was in 97, we were working with uh, indigenous peoples uh, uh, in uh, Australia, in Hawaii, in, in the uh, US, in Canada. Uh, and fast forward to when was it we were in uh, Quebec? Mm -hmm. Maybe four or five years ago? About four or five years ago, uh, we were invited to participate in a uh, uh, 
a conference and a celebration on uh, DNA on loan. And it was, uh, it were native peoples from, uh, from all over. And uh, what they had in common was that they had established and were operating their own tissue banks because there was that control over your body, your body parts that enabled then uh, the people to say, you know, you can do research, but these are our priorities. These are the priorities we want research. What we don't, if, if we're afflicted with uh, uh, high incidence of juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis. What we don't want to have happen is you come over here talking all kinds of good stuff about helping us to deal with uh, uh, with that problem, and it turns out that you know that is not so sexy for you as a researcher, uh, and perhaps then diverting that those tissues, that information that's ours to research on, for example, schizophrenia, which happened in Arizona. Uh, so it's, it's that idea of you are a resource, your land is a resource, your water is the resource, you know, and by God, we, we, we want that, and we're going to do anything we can do to get at that. And the same kind of lack of uh, informed consent as it related to sterilization has been pretty much uh, uh, the, the whole modus operandi of an interaction between uh, Indian Health Service and, and Native, uh, especially Native women. Uh, I need help, S sign here. You know, you don't have to say these procedures are conditioned on your uh, your approval of uh, you know signing off on that. You that's the inference, and so you you have this kind of continuation of this kind of uh, uh, I call it a, oppression, this subjugation uh, of uh, of uh, native peoples. Uh, to, to get at whatever the resource might be, intellectual property, genetic uh, property. So let me add uh, one another point about um, where the, the tribes having control over the, the, the tissues for the medical research, they also could control that the tissue would come back. Right. So there could be whatever was the, the appropriate, it would come back to the individual. So whatever was the, was the appropriate ceremony and way of, of, of treating, dealing with the tissue could be done and it wouldn't end up as, as medical waste, you know, in some hospital's trash can. And so, you know, there were so many, there were so many layers um, where the control had been lacking and was, you know, was now, you know, being, being you know, reclaimed, you know, by, by the tribes through, through their, their tribally controlled tissue banks. Well, have, have uh, uh, are, are there similar kinds of uh, uh, health, medical related kinds of uh, uh, situations uh, that, that you're aware of uh, that's happening right here and now? Well, you know, <clears throat> uh, about Indian Health Service and the government, um, uh, treating us as though we do not have uh, control uh, over our uh, persons, or over ourselves. Um, when they were using Depo-Provera um, experimentally, basically on, on indigenous women, we really fought for informed consent. And they said that 
once you cross the thresh threshold uh, and into an Indian Health Service facility, consent is implied. <coughs> and and it, we fought that um, and we you know, sued them. Um, it is not implied. It is not a given. It's uh, you have to have informed consent. Right. And um, that was a huge issue. Um, yeah, but that was part of the, uh, the whole trust uh, responsibility there in the relationship where they felt that um, they could make the decision for us as to what they did with us and uh, the kinds of health care that they provided. And um, that because we go to a facility, an IHS facility, um, once we walk in, the consent is implied. And we don't have a choice in terms of, uh, you know, they are a primary health care provider. It is, a, it is a right through treaty um, that we uh, receive health care and you cannot put those kinds of uh, conditions and restrictions uh, on a person's health care um, but that's what they do they continue to do that and and again uh, you know we have to continue to fight and uh, make our uh, tribal leadership uh, uh, leadership aware that this goes on um, you know, we've sued the, um, the uh, Indian Health Service um, a few times along the way in order to get them to stop this kind of uh, behavior. And, um, you know, it's not an easy struggle. Um, no, right. Because you're up against uh, a huge legal machine. And fortunately, we have a lot of allies out there um, that are willing to help uh, with legal uh, services and, and to help us sue uh, when we uh, when we need to. So um, now it's not an it's not an easy road to uh, and it's not an easy path to walk. But you know we have to just continue, uh, you know, to fight for our, our rights. So uh, we have a question here. Uh, why did it take a woman from England to come and film to get the story told? When she filmed, did she hire local indigenous videographers and film crews? Uh, person goes on to say, I saw the liaison credit, but heard how, and this is a quote, they didn't want to talk to me. Were cultural customs surrounding gift giving, not asking for more than what was needed, and respect around names honored uh, because I can see a lot of my skin folks seeing this movie and getting I'm, I'm, I'm emboldened, emboldened uh, in already rude and disrespectful communication. Well, you know, it would have been really um, pretty incredible if a native filmmaker would have stood up to the podium and done this. But, you know, um, Lorna walked into our office and uh, it was a very cold winter uh, winter day and we started talking and she asked if, if I would help her with this film and I said there's so many so many women who um, whose story this is and um, I'll only do it if you will uh, if you will take it to heart is to you know, what we share with you. And um, so she was able to, to locate Jean, uh, Fast Horse or White Horse um, uh, from the Diné people. And uh, she felt comfortable sharing her story. Um, you know, Lorna was working on a, a, a shoestring budget. It took her 10 years to uh, do this film because there were no resources. So she would get out there and hustle uh, for money to, uh, to be able to do a little more on the film. And, um, and pretty soon she'd you know, 
email me or give me a call and so I'm coming back to town and I've got this footage to show you and and um, I mean sometimes a couple of years would go by and I just kind of wondered you know what's going on with the project um, and she just continued she to to uh, want to document this part of our history and it was really important because uh, like I said I'm 71 and a lot of my sisters were dying were were getting older and uh, passing on and um, so you know we just told her to move forward uh, before there are no more uh, survivors to tell their story and this is our story and and uh, I think she did a good job um, did she use uh, local yeah, as much as she could I mean sometimes it was just her and one other person who was uh, rolling the film and she didn't have a big crew um, it was like I said you know done on uh, with very few resources and she would go back to England and convince people to uh, put resources up um, so that she could complete the uh, the documentary and then she'd come back over here and film some more and um, uh, sometimes she was just by herself or maybe with you know one other person so it wasn't a big fancy um, operation right. it was it was truly a grassroots uh, operation and uh, film and uh, it needed to, to be told uh, before there were no more survivors um, and uh, that's that's very that's very important. We have to think about that, you know, and uh, realize that we do have sisters and allies out there. And um, you know, I'll always look at her as a, a very young, brilliant woman who uh, saw the importance of telling this story and and helping us to get it out there. And um, so. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Jean is probably uh, feels, I, I can't speak for Jean how she feels, but um, she's a survivor and she, she told her story and she trusted Lorna enough to disclose, yeah. you know, and, and she did, she disclosed her story, how it happened to her. And, um, there were other women, uh, Native women, who uh, who were in, in the uh, film who disclosed their stories as well and uh, trusted Jean enough to do it and felt that it was important enough um, so that we could get this out there and, and get the, the project completed and use it as an organizing tool. Yeah, I just want to echo that, you know, we we as Native people, even if we all stand up together and use our skills, use our voices to shout at the top of our lungs on some of these issues, we're still not loud enough and we rely heavily on allies. And I don't see any problem with uh, a European woman helping to bring this history to the surface because no Native filmmaker stepped up to do it. Um, and I've personally worked with non-Native people on a lot of very important Native issued centric topics. And I couldn't have done any of the work without their help. And um, even more so recently, you know, we have um, just recently passed some legislature here in the state of Colorado surrounding missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. And we could not have done that without our main sponsor, who was a white woman. And so you know, we need we need those allies and our elders. I've been told by many elders across different tribes that we we it was prophesied that we will have we will need to have allies that are not native and indigenous. And so I I support that. We have um, a couple of folks have posted in the chat room just um, their comments um, echoing what what um, the two of you have just said that uh, uh, Maxine, who's a longtime friend of the festival says, uh, I think there are very few native filmmakers, especially native women as it is. 
So allies who have been wanting and willing to work on an important documentary is something I can appreciate. Uh, we have an another comment. Um, thank you, uh, Sharon, for sh so much for sharing the backstory on the project. I agree it needed to be told. We lost so many of our elders and aunties here and so much history. I can respect Lorna for her diligence. Thank you. Um, you know, we've we've um, we've had conversations with with uh, folks, you know, over the years where they have worked worked really well with with a non native filmmaker and where the filmmaker has been very respectful of the uh, with you know the the tribe's perspective and the perspective of the people that they're presenting and they're working hard to not to be imposing their voice into the film, but to really be capturing. Uh, the voice of, of the people that they're documenting. And I, I do have to um, say that, uh, uh, you know, Lorna is um, pretty grassroots uh, person and um, very sensitive uh, to, to, uh, to our story and, um, was really very respectful at every every step of the way, and she was always worried about um, stepping on our toes. I mean, is she out of place? Tell me, you know. She she really wanted to know um, because she just felt that this was so important that uh, this documentary be made, and she made a big commitment and um, did a really good job. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big gap in, in the generation there with, with this information. Um, and I'm glad that this film was made, this documentary, so that our younger generation knows this history. You know, a lot of, a lot of us have worked years and years on, on, on these topics of reproductive justice and indigenous communities and um, the younger generation, uh, there's this void because it isn't taught in schools, not even in the native schools. Um, and so they, a lot of them don't even know that this occurred. And so that's what's so valuable about this documentary is that it's making young, the younger generation pay attention and to, um, to listen. Even, even a lot of the tribal leadership um, weren't, weren't aware of the younger leadership. The older, you know, yes, but um, a lot of the younger. So uh, it's important that everybody sees this film so that uh, our tribal councils don't just say yes to anything that Indian Health Service wants to do or the government. Yeah to do um it, it's it's um it, it's an important film and um i'm just you know glad that you all decided to uh show this film and um that you have so many people calling in and interested uh making comments um because uh we're getting older and uh you know a lot of us will be gone soon and um, the film will live on. And it's young people like yourself uh, that will um, carry this message on and, and uh, whether it's through your artwork or, um, you know, but through your activism. And so uh, that's a, you know, powerful thing right there um, in, in passing the baton or the torch to the next generation. How, how are we doing time wise? Uh, we've got about five minutes. Okay. I, you know, Sharon, one of the things I really appreciated about Laura's work was the way she wove uh, uh, Ravenholt's uh, commentary uh, into, the, into the film. Uh, because that's, uh, uh, for me, that's, that's one of the, uh, the things that's really difficult sometimes for tribes uh, and, and, and 
tribal organizations to uh, uh, get their uh, their arms around. Uh, you you can read something like uh, uh, bestsellers like Paul the, the Ehrlichs and the Population Bomb. Uh, you can read about uh, 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 the war on poverty and the, and the nexus between uh, family size, family planning, and uh, uh, the elimination of of, uh, of of poverty. It's sometimes very difficult for folks to to say, okay, this is happening here. And it sounds benign, but but the actual operational operationalization of those policies turn out to visit some very horrific results on marginalized people, on 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 women, uh, on on Indian tribes, because it's. And that's one of the difficulties I think we we all have because these these kinds of discussions are going on in in in, in the most benign forum. They're talking about eliminating poverty. Well, for but the net result is the eliminating of Indian people, of black right. people. Of Puerto Rican people, you see, and and what's needed are the kinds of a uh, of, of folks who can, in a sense, look at these kinds of suggestions, these kinds of recommendations, and say, figure out how is it going to bite us in our collective asses because that's that's the part that's 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 really needed and and what do we need to do uh to protect ourselves or protect our our, our behinds from getting bitten uh from all of this innocuous benign uh policies programs well like i said earlier it was presented to um, the average American as family planning, but to us, it was the war on poverty. You know, they were launching a war against us and they were doing it through uh, uh, population control. Um, and that's what went down. Um, so that's about all I'm gonna say. I'd like to hear from uh, Danielle before we convene. I mean, you know, that's interesting, this topic. I came across a pamphlet recently um, that demonstrated it was an IHS pamphlet from, you know, probably the 50s or 60s that showed stick figures. I mean, very dumbed down that was presented to Native people. And Sharon, you probably are familiar with this pamphlet, but it shows a mother and a father stick figures with one child and 10 horses. And then on the other side, it shows a mother and a father with maybe five or six children with one horse and it was to represent this idea of the more children you have the poorer you're going to be so maybe you need to think about not having any more children and so you know it was just a, a very manipulative way again like a war on poverty right you need to be rich you want to be an american you should you know have the 1.2 children and the picket fence and you know then you'll be richer um, and have a nice nicer quality of life but ultimately it was all about assimilation and cultural genocide and, and ultimately trying to wipe native people out and ultimately not leaving that choice to the to the family because yeah. ultimately saying well if you're not choosing the way we want you to choose we're just going to go ahead and, and do these non-consensual sterilizations i want and i just Oh. I wanted to just make something real quick clear because I'm not sure what the, the audience is and what their level of um, uh, knowing is, but IHS, Indian Health Services, is a, um, you know, a, a healthcare system located on reservations that's federally ran. So I just wanted to be clear, we kind of threw out IHS, Indian Health Services, but I wanted to, everyone to really understand what that meant and what, who it, who's running it, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good uh, 
That's a very good point um, to share with everybody. Um, yeah, you know, we cannot uh, continue to um, allow the government to control everything, especially when it comes to uh, our families. And the um, drawing that you were talking about, it, you know, it's this whole colonization uh, process of getting us to want to be like, you know, the average American um, and to try to fit into that mindset. And that's not, it's never gonna, it's never gonna happen. That's not, you know, how we look at things. You know, family is uh, most important, um, not the size of our house or how many cars we have, um, but it's your children and your nieces and your nephews and your grandchildren and uh, family is, is um, the most important thing to us. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just so, not work. I think that's a great way to end the conversation. Yeah, I know we're 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 just a minute or two over time, but I want to. Uh, there, somebody was asking uh, whether they could don whether there was a responsible way to donate time or services to survivors of the forced sterilization campaign, and it's kind of a, a segue, Sharon, into what I wanted to raise. If you you could also address that, but also uh, let people know that um, your center had. Uh, had a bit of a, a disaster recently and, and folks can donate to, um, to, to rebuild the center. Can yes. you tell people about that? Yeah, December 20th, um, we were hit by arson and uh, we've been there for 35 years and it burnt down. A lot of records, a lot of artwork, a lot of, it just, uh, it just breaks my heart when I think about it. Uh, so we're in the process of rebuilding and we do have a uh, GoFundMe, uh, um, page and so you can find it on Facebook. Um, you can, you know, Google GoFundMe and, and donate. Um, but um, yeah, we need all the help we can get. We're in a temporary location now. We've got the radio station back up and fortunately our shelter wasn't, you know, it's about four blocks away and our transitional housing uh, was a couple blocks away. So it, it just um, got the resource center, but that's the main uh, building. That's where all of our language uh, programming goes on and, and a radio station and a food pantry and a lot of our policy work. Um, thanks to the Sophia Smith collection at Smith College, a lot of our documents had been uh, archived. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, in previous yeah. year. But we're still trying to put together the uh, everything and rebuild. So... Yeah, donations would be wonderful. Thank you. And I see um, Jean. Well, we have a lot of genes on this program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got two genes up uh, on screen. We got a gene from the film. Uh, gene from DMNS uh, put the link. The GoFundMe link is up in the chat room now. Um, so go fund her. Yeah. They need help. <laughs> Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank Pre you. Uh, appreciate the work you all do. Thank Thanks you for to, having us. Thanks to both our speakers and, and to our audience for joining us. And of course, as always, to DMNS for hosting the program. Of course, thank you all. This, for those of you who were listening to the very first part, how many times did I say that this discussion was gonna be incredible? And thank you all so much for having it with us. Thank you for joining us for Indigenous Film. Just a quick reminder again that on June 8th, Indigenous Film will be in person woo, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. No registration is necessary and the details are available on the museum's website. Let me make sure that that link is in the chat right now. And uh, I am going to start our usual end slide, but I feel like there are a lot of really important links. So I just wanna make sure if you wanna stay on and just see all of those links that I've been dropping in the chat this whole time, if you wanna get those refreshed, please stick around. Um, I will be dropping a uh, PayPal donation bucket link in there for the, oh my goodness. <laughs> 
what is that for? That's what it's for. Okay, so. uh, for the inter yes, the International <laughs> Institute for Indigenous Resource Management, and I will drop that link for the Resource Center as well again. So let me stop jabbering. Let me get this started, and we can end our night. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, all of our panelists, all of our audience. Thank you again, and we hope to see you next month live and in person. Good night, everyone. Bye.